bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Welcome to the Hour of Deliverance. I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes. And uh, email somebody, call somebody, text somebody. We're going to be looking at James. And um, there's we're going to be specifically looking at Amplified. That's mostly for me because uh, as a theologian, I love to get all into the intricacies of the word. But there's some very plain things in the book of James that, uh, well, frankly... The book, James, Peter, John, Jude, by the placement of them so up on the book of Revelation, a lot of times we don't read them. Now, that's not supposed to be that way because we should be going through the word every day. Uh, God already showed us through the law, which is the schoolmaster uh, for those of us who want to go on. Um, the, the, it's just a schoolmaster and through that God showed us that kings are supposed to have their own personal copy of the word and they're supposed to read it every day and they're supposed to read it a couple times a day and now we, when God wrote that when God had that written in the old covenant we didn't know that he was going to call us and engraft us in and cause us to be a nation of, of kings and priests we didn't know that then he knew that but he laid down these things for us, for us to know. So that when we come and we read the word and we know we're supposed to have our own copy, and most of us, especially in the United States, we have several copies in our homes. But do we read them every single day? The way God said, the way he set it up in kindergarten, or pardon, what, he, what did he say, schoolmaster, in the, in the preschool, in the elementary school. And most of us who name the name of Christ, we are past elementary school, are we not? So, I know that I shared it with you before, but I'll remind you again that in the uh, early New Testament church, when you find the groupings of the letters, you find James, Peter, John, Judah are usually together, and you find that they usually come after the Acts and the Apostles. Now, there's some easy reasons for that. The Most of the New Testament church was Jewish and you, you, the Old Covenant is the Pentateuch. So the New Testament Pentateuch, as it were, uh, the, the foundation of, of this New Covenant would be the four Gospels and the Acts. And then you have the prophets. Remember, Jesus always talked about Moses and the prophets. And in one place he said Moses, the prophets, and the Psalm over in Luke. And the Psalms, now the Psalms is a whole section, not just the book of Psalms, but it's the last section of the, the uh, Hebrew canon. And so the New Testament saints, they grouped the scriptures in that manner because they had a mindset and an understanding of God's precept concerning the Pentateuch, the, or the law, the prophets, and the Psalms that we kind of miss out on unless somebody's teaching it to you. But for that reason is why I'm taking us through James, Peter, John, Jude. Now I already did Jude and I'll probably do it again. But we need to understand that that comes right up after the New Testament Pentateuch, the Gospels and the Book of Acts as terms of importance and what we're to live and what we're to know and how we're going to fulfill all of that that's in the first five books. I'm talking about the first five books of the New Testament. And so... Uh, when when you see in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, pardon me, 1 Corinthians 14, for instance, when uh, the Apostle Paul is, is giving, or the Word is giving uh, the, that phrase, the space of the unlearned. Now, he's talking about tongues, how will one who's in the space of the un unlearned uh, say amen to what you're praying if he doesn't know. Now, that space of the unlearned is what we would liken today to New Believers class. He, he's still desiring the sincere milk of the word and growing by it. And he's a new believer. So the new believer, after they got the New Testament or the New Covenant Pentateuch, the Gospels and the Book of Acts, they were, they were given James, Peter, John, Jude uh, to know how to walk this thing. To know what it is when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. They, they uh, didn't let this walk be hard there was enough hardships in the earth in the politics and the persecution 
but the walk. Ah, Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So how to live this out? Now, one of the things that we find in James, Peter, John, Jude is the cross. Now, how do I mean that? Uh, probably not the way that you think. I mean that in the sense that the Pentateuch, it gives you that vertical relationship. It lets you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It lets you know that he's very God while very man. While very man, do you get it? He's very God. And he showed us how to worship God. He showed us that God sent his only Son. He showed us that he is the Messiah. He showed us that search the scriptures. And them, we think we have eternal life. Or they, the... the uh, t we think we have eternal life, but it's them that speak of him. He showed us that vertical relationship. But then in his living as a man, he showed us the horizontal. That's the part of the cross that I'm talking about. The, the Pentateuch gives us very much of the vertical. And the, the prophets give us very much the horizontal. It's what he said about the first and the second commandment. He said, the first commandment is love the Lord, your God, with all your heart your soul, your mind, and your strength. But then he says the second, that horizontal one, is like it. It's like it. Love your brother as yourself. And in this you fulfill all the law and the prophets. And why am I telling you that? Because Jesus came to fulfill. Yeah, he told us that. So how did the New Testament understand the fulfillment? Well, you learn the Gospels and live the Gospels and the Acts and you've accepted the Lord. You're filled with the Holy Ghost and now you learn to walk this horizontal. You say you love God, you walk the horizontal. And, um, uh, well, let's look at it. James. And God follows his own principles and whenever he is and he always interrupts and tells us that he's not following his principles but God's principles are that the elder is is uh, takes precedent when God says one two three he means one two three he means that first is first second is second and so on and he does that certain places in the scripture and you'll notice that the way that the books fell fall out uh, James is the eldest of James Peter John Jude now we'll explain to you why the younger is the last book of the new covenant altogether. But right now, let's just look at James, the servant of God. We already did this first part, but I'm going to recap a little bit. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now that tells us right there with these 12 tribes that he's writing to, that they've been converted, they've accepted Messiah, but they specifically have an understanding that the rest of us who are grafted in, who come in later, uh, we just don't have Remember that when there was the controversy over Cornelius, the Italian band, isn't it nice to know that the Italians were the first one to get in on the kingdom? Uh, well, the Samaritans, if you split hairs on it, but the Samaritans were part Jewish. But here the Italians came in and there was all this controversy because God and the Holy Ghost interrupts Peter preaching, fills them with the Holy Ghost, and now the apostles are saying that they're filled just like we're filled, but they don't know the law and the prophets. They don't know how to walk all the different things that we know how to walk. And so they had the council uh, and, and they decided, which is written in scripture, that, well, you don't put this burden of following the Levitical law on these new saints. Uh, don't fornicate, don't eat things sacrificed to idol. You've accepted, you confess with your mouth, you've accepted the Lord, we'll accept you because we see that God has accepted you. And they saw that because he filled them with the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm not talk, telling you, please, I know that there's doctrines out there that say that you have to be filled with the Holy Ghost in order to be saved. No, you have to be born of the Holy Ghost. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. He's talking about how the Holy Ghost births you into the body of Christ, not the infilling of the Holy Ghost, okay? So, uh, it's what he told Nicodemus, what Jesus said, you know, you must be born again. And the Holy Spirit is the one who births you into the kingdom of God. So, James, he's specifically talking to uh, uh, people that have a background. Uh, it tells us in Hebrews and it also tells us in Romans that God gave them the first principles of the oracles of God. He gave them an understanding of the things of God's oracles and God's, God's precepts that, frankly, 
most non-Jewish, non-Hebrew uh, are going to have for not having followed in and, and, and uh, been inundated in God's word in these things. So the book of James is going to have some nuances here that if you're your background is in Hebrew, and I'm talking about the way that you study and the way that God brought you along and who you are. There's going to be some things that are said there that they'll just completely go by you. Kind of like uh, when I was, uh, my husband and I were raising our children, and there was um, uh, the Muppets were on, and the Muppets could be watched by adults and children alike and both enjoy them. Now, the jokes. Ah, they were funny and hilarious that were adults that an adult understood. And uh, children may not. They might be laughing, but not at the same thing or for the same reasons. Well, it's very like that. Not that something is secret, but that just because of your maturity or because of what you've already trafficked in, there's some things that can just go by you. Sometimes over your head, but so other times just by you that you didn't, you didn't see it, didn't notice it to get it or not get it. And the book of James has some of that. But oh my, because it is the word of God, because it's alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any, any two-edged sword. Oh yes, it'll divide asunder soul and spirit. It'll show the thoughts and the intents of the heart in some very specific circumstances. So understand that there is more here, more meat here, when you understand from the principles of the oracles of God. And you're not left in the dark because you're under the blood. You're under Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So he says, my brother in Canada, all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of our faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And I'm rushing through that because we did that part. And I'll want to stop there and traffic there a while because that's where we're living. These are the times. These are the end times when we're living where all of these trials come in on us and we want to know how to do. But we did that a program on that already. So if any of you lack wisdom, uh, let, pardon me, verse 4, let patience have our perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Saints of God, please understand, yes, God wants you to be perfect. He's not going to sprout your wings and send you to heaven once you're perfect. He wants you to be faultless. He wants you to be blameless. He wants you to live that way. You are valuable to live in the earth that way. I would love to pause and give you a testimony. Maybe I will in a little bit because uh, that thing is burning in my soul about a brother. Uh who's walking perfect, please understand that even the Old Testament saints, so certain one of them, uh, God testimony about him, Job was one of them, that he was perfect in his ways. So let's move away from these uh, popular ideas that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Remember Jesus rebuked a, a group of people in the Gospels and he said that your traditions make the word of God of no effect. Well, we're, we have some too today. And one of them is that you can't be perfect. Well, he says it right here. He says it right here. That's what he's talking about. And so he wants us to go on. So we're going to pause and then we're going to come back and we're going to go on with James. Call somebody, email somebody, text somebody, because there's meat here for the seasoned one, and there's milk here for uh, the one who's thirsty and wants to taste and see that the Lord is good and that his word is mm, mm, good, better than 
uh, that soup that had that commercial. That that. Uh, so we're looking at we're looking at this, and I am r rushing over it so that I don't stop. We did the program on the first part, but um, I'm going to slow down now, and we're going to look at this <sighs> wisdom. I, I love it that God won't beat you up because you lack wisdom. Now, you're terrible when you don't have wisdom. If you, you go into Proverbs and it lets you know that uh, there's uh, different definitions of foolish in the scripture. One of them is stupid and one of them is wicked and uh, uh, one of them is full of iniquity. There's there's a problem with foolishness and it's on different levels. All kind, All foolishness is not the same. And Yet each of it, he's referring, he's talking to the one that are supposed to be the people of God. And so we want you to understand how not to be foolish, how not to be stupid, how not to be wicked, and how not to be full of iniquity. And I promise you that any of us who love the Lord, when we're wicked, we're not being wicked on purpose. We're loving the Lord. We think we're doing what he said. Just like when Jesus rebuked the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They thought they were so full of the word, teaching the word, and following the word when they did what Jesus said they were doing, and that was make the word of God of no effect. We like to look at that. Whenever we're pointing the finger and seeing them and they, we're probably looking at ourselves. It's, we get our own attention. We do. Whether it's us in another stage, in another place, in another uh, time I'm talking about in our development please understand most of what you notice is yourself and so foolish one of the things to so appreciate about the Lord and so praising for is that when we are foolish and when we are not wise and when when we're moving in something that is not wise and again we're not doing that on purpose we're not trying to be stupid we're not trying to be wicked we're not trying to be full of iniquity but he tells you he tells you that uh, you're double-minded. Well, let's see. Let's say it the way the word says. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything. The double-minded man. And, and he's going to let you know that you just ask for wisdom. And God won't upbraid you. He won't, he won't talk about you. He won't beat you up. I have a relative that's passed away now. But they were known that they'll give you anything. But that wasn't the whole story. The other part of the story was that they'll give you anything after they give you a lecture and tell you this and tell you that. And you spend an hour being dressed down, dressed up, walked around. Then they'll give it to you. Well, God doesn't do this. And this is what he's telling you here. That that um, if you're double-minded, don't think that you're going to get anything that you ask from God. Uh, now, but let him ask in faith. Now, please understand, when you want to look at your definitions of faith, that's fine. I'd love to do word studies. I absolutely love to do word studies. But God has given you some, some nuggets here so that if you don't know a word study, you can read in your language. He says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. That gives you the idea that faith doesn't waver. Faith isn't this way one day and another way in, on, uh, the next day. And, or when it does that, the, the, one, the part that's wavering is not faith. And so he says, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. It's not faith that's moving you. It's not even love that's moving you, because faith works by love. And you're tossed, and you'll be like Peter when he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. And he came, and he walked on the water, because he was looking at Jesus. And you look at Jesus, you can't help but to have faith. And, and that I'm talking about if you're loving, because faith works by love. But when he looked at the storm, you know you look at the storm, you can't help to, but sink. Some of you, you say that you have a melancholy personality and uh, that you, listen, psychologists have said that melancholy, pe melancholy people, and I forget the percentage, it's a very high percentage, are usually accurate. They're accurate about the facts. They're accurate about the things that they see that are pitfalls. They're accurate about the things that they see that are dilemmas. They're accurate, but, huh. The same studies show that they also don't get much done. Now, if you're going to walk in faith, it's it's about moving and not wavering. It's not even about standing still. Yes, it, we have stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But in faith, when God says move, you'll move. When he told, told Abraham, move from here and go to there, he moved. And God counted it to him as righteousness in the faith chapter. So 
It's not just one thing. Faith will make it so that you're mobile and you're pliable in the things of the Lord with the word of the Lord and obeying the Lord. But if you if you are double minded, if you're if you're wavering, you're not strong in your faith. Uh, you're tossed and you're driven of the wind of the sea and you'll be like Peter and you'll sink. And he said, Lord, save me. And the God saved him. Jesus saved him. You call on Jesus and ask him to save you, he'll save you. And whether it's the, your heart or the circumstance, because Peter had already given his heart. So let not that man, that one who's back and forth and back and forth, people who, you know that in your heart, even if you're not sharing it with anybody, or most of you can't help but to share it with people. You talk a lot when you don't have things right. Uh, it says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. You're not, you're not, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to get the good thing. You're not going to get uh, the grand thing. It's a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. You're not just unstable in the thing that you're asking. You're unstable in everything that you do and everything that you're about. And so he says, let the brother of low degree rejoice that he's exalted. Now, how did he just jump there? It's not a jump. God is <laughs> not schizophrenic and he's not, um, uh, what did they call it? Bipolar. <laughs> Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Now God's showing you some things here. And God is the one who said that humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he shall exalt you in due time. So that when you're the brother of low degree, rejoice in it when you're exalted. You rejoice. Don't Look around thinking, oh no, we can't trust this one, can't trust that one. Yes, the word that's, you know, that the rich has many friends and the poor can't even find a brother. The scripture lets you know these things, but they're not for you to pout about it. My goodness, if you grumble, over in Hebrews, God calls uh, the grumbling that the children of Israel did, he calls it an evil heart of unbelief. Remember, I told you that when we, the people of God, are doing wickedness and doing evil, we're not trying to. We are so sincere. We mean so well. But we have to follow God's word and stay on God's word. So, But the rich, in that he's made low. If you're rich, then you you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And when you go through trials, and he, he dealt with that, when you go through all kinds of trials, you rejoice. You rejoice when you're made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. So that, yes, God made you beautiful. God made the rose beautiful. But it's here today. It's gone tomorrow. He made the orchids absolutely lovely. And he made some orchids actually will cleanse water. They have their beauty and they have their efficacy. They have their purpose, but they're going to pass away. So that you don't, you know, if God blessed you to have riches, you rejoice about that. But then you know that that's going to pass away. So he says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. You see, the scripture tells us time and chance will happen to all men. You know, he tells us that over in Ecclesiastes. And um, so when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life. You don't say that, ah, this shouldn't be happening to me. There's a lot of things that shouldn't be happening in the earth. But since Adam fell, it's happening. Cain shouldn't have slain his brother Abel, but it happened. And God has provision for it. We shouldn't be lost in sin. And so God sent his son so that it doesn't have to be that way. But some people will be lost. So, okay, don't uh, be so lamenting that you just can't, just can't get with what God has given and so, for the sun is no sooner risen, uh, pardon me, I went back too far. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. You see, we're not living just for this, this time, this flesh uh, in this earth. The Lord hath promised to them that love him. The Lord has promised a crown of life. Uh, I want to... Uh, Go there, but I want to I get some things done here. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God can't be tempted with, of evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, God talks about temptation two ways. One way he talks about it, the way it says here, of trying. Because the trying of your faith is more precious than gold. And he's going to let you know these things. But when you're tempted that you're drawn away, and he's going to deal with it here. Well, let me go right to it. He says, let no man say, this is 13, uh, James 1, 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God tempted me. Uh, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. 
But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when that lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Now God's showing you there's a process here. And you might not know where you are in the process if that happened to you. And we're talking about the one who, the brethren, the one who starts out, you, you're loving the Lord. But then you go through something and ah, maybe you're going through because you're looking at somebody rich and you're of low degree. And instead of, instead of being thankful to God that he will exalt you in due time, because his word says so. Uh, you're you're so busy looking at the temptation or maybe you you're saying well if he didn't want me to have it he wouldn't have put it in front of me I've heard some uh, preachers mostly say that about a woman that wasn't their wife that they shouldn't have had uh, no you can't go do that huh. but uh, he says but every man that is tempted when he's drawn away of itself his own lust and when lust is conceived it brings forth death and, uh, pardon me, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. I was telling uh, my daughter th the other day that, you know, when we look at an acorn, unless you already understand how it grows to an oak tree and that the oak tree is the biggest, strongest thing that there is. I was telling it to another uh, person in the church as well. But some of us, God gives us the vision to see and know that this is the seed of a thing and what it's going to look like grown up so that you want to deal with this thing. And so God's putting it down right now. When, you see, when you're when you tempted, it's like the acorn. It's, it's not going to know what it grows up to be if you don't deal with it. Acorn's a good thing. Oak tree's a good thing. We're just making the analogy that a tiny little thing like an acorn grows a big thing like a oak tree. It doesn't do it overnight. It does it by process, and God's telling you here that just because you mean well, there's a process to sin drawing you away. And so he promised you a crown of life, and God's always like that. He gives you the gift. He provides everything for you more than enough. God is a more than enough God. He provides you more than enough so that when you have trials or when you're tempted, either way, well, he's going to tell you here that there's a way of escape, but when it's temptation. But he, your trials, what he tells you to do is count that, count that all joy. So, the know that just because God didn't flush your toilet when you jumped in the wrong way right away, he didn't flush you right away. Please understand that when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Well, you want to thank God that he didn't finish you yet. You know, I'm talking about those of you who are in a mess, and you know you're in a mess, and you're making excuses and trying to justify. Listen, Jesus Christ justifies. You don't justify yourself. He justifies us, and he justifies us by his blood, by holiness and righteousness. So when you find yourself justifying yourself, stop in mid-syllable and repent. If you find someone is justifying themselves to you, ask them just to stop. You stop talking, stop saying, stop justifying, whatever. But just stop because Jesus is our justifier. Or you can just say Jesus is the one who justifies. So that if you're talking to an elder, you're not rebuking an elder. So he says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Don't, don't make this mistake, okay? And he's telling us this because the mistake is made. So don't you be the one who makes the mistake. And he calls you beloved. Like, I want you to really understand this. I want you to get it from my heart. I want you to know that I'm telling you this because I love you. I'm telling you this to cause you to grow. Because I'm telling you this in faith because faith works by love. He says, do not err. My beloved brethren, every good, every good gift. Do you hear this? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. And he, he puts himself in a certain way to show us about the one who gives gifts. This isn't Santa Claus. This isn't Aladdin's lamp. No, this is the father of lights. He lets you know a father gives gifts to his children. And it's not because of their deserving, even though he might de divide them according to what they're capable of, but he gives them because they're father. And here he says father of lights. We're going to come back and look at this some more. Amen. The 
said that I wanted to give you this in Amplified, so let me go back up what we had in Amplified, because it really makes some of these things clear, because it is Word. I don't want you just to hear a thing, because I'm saying it. I want you to hear what the Word is saying. And to look at this uh, James 8 through 11, it says, uh, For being as he is, a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irresolute, that's what he's talking about, the, uh, uh, the, the double-minded man. That's how he lives. And it's not just in the decision, the thing that he's asking God for. He's unstable, unreliable, and uh, uncertain about everything he, watch this, thinks, feels, and decides. Uh, that has to do with uh, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But those areas, now we did that in another program. But let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his elevation. Make sure you glory when God exalts you. And and brethren, when you see that God from, took someone who was in humble circumstance and exalted them, don't beat them up and don't get mad at them for, for being exalted. Glorify God. He does the exalting. Uh, I know we have a tendency to want to pull, in some circles, want to pull somebody down as we see them rise up, but God does the exalting. And then he says... And let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his elevation as a Christian called to, to, the, to the true riches and to be an heir of God. Remember, beloved, I would above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So the root of the thing is your soul prosperity, that you are rooted and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's going to spring up some everlasting fruit, fruit that remains. It also means that there's some other promises that if you forsake father, mother, if you forsake houses and land, he says he'll give you uh, 30, 60, 100 fold. And he says in this life. And please know, uh, saints of God, that when you go to that verse, when he gives you a list, you list them out. List, list if you forsake. List out the things that you forsake. And then list out the things that he says that he'll give you, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And he makes a promise in this life. And he also says with persecution. And I'm pretty sure he just says 100 fold. But you go back and look at it. But make a list. The things that if you forsake. And make a list of the things that he will give you 100 fold with persecution in this life. And you will notice that the list is slightly different. It's almost exactly the same. And God didn't make a mistake when he left out one thing off of the other list. He left out spouse. God doesn't mean for you to be trading off spouses. Even for those of you that do it correctly by court, by the piece of paper, 
and not jumping from bed to bed, but you, you divorce this one and then you uh, go before whatever and have whatever ceremony uh, and do it by law correctly. God doesn't mean for you to be trading that off. If you, here again, you take a look at the list. He says, if you forsake mother, father, sister, brother, houses, land, husband, wife, he says, for my sake, he says, I'll give you a hundredfold in this life. And then he goes through the list again. And when he says, mother, father, sister, brother, houses, land, and he doesn't name the spouse because God wants you to know some things about that. He doesn't promise another spouse, even though we see, okay, we're looking at James here. So. And the rich person ought to glory, this is verse 10, in being made humble by being, uh, being shown his human frailty because like the flower of the grass he fades away. You don't go, uh, what happened? What did I do? What did I do? And I know that Job did that. <coughs> now Job did the what I do, what I do in the sense of he knew that he walked righteous. Now his miserable comforter, friends, some of you have some miserable friends, and Job's friends were, they were friends, but they were miserable comforters. And they, they were showing him that, ah, oh, well, this only would have happened to you if you were a, sin, a sinner. Another showing this would have happened to you if you weren't sincere. And while those things that they were saying were thing, are true isms, they were not the whole truth of the matter. And so Job's examining it, and he knows that I lived righteous, but who can call themselves righteous before God? But I'd lived like I was supposed to live, except for that who can, nobody's going to justify himself before God. And he's going with this. He's not going back and forth. He's going with it that it's not according to the thing that I understand, you know, that, that if you do wrong, this is going to happen. If you do, I didn't do wrong, and yet this is happening. So what is it, Lord? A few weeks ago, I had a sty. Pardon me, I didn't have a sty. I didn't have a sty at all. That's a lie. I didn't have a sty. I thought I had a sty. But I knew that it couldn't possibly be a sty. Now, my, my children are, my oldest is almost 40, 39 years old. But when they were tiny, uh, uh, all the children around were, were getting styes. And God said, you won't get styes. You don't get styes. You will not have styes. Uh, it's not in your family. Now, I, I, I understood that a certain way, then you probably heard it. <laughs> but I understood God. He knows how to talk to me. So here I am, almost 40 years later, and my eyes swelled up. And uh, certain things started happening, and I thought it was a sty. And I'm like, wait, this, this doesn't work, because God says. He wasn't just, I don't get them then when they were little. It's just, we don't get styes. He hasn't, he hasn't done that. And that's not to say that other people, that other people that weren't getting them, God was letting us know for our family. That's not something our family walks. And I understood this from the Lord. And yet here I, my eye was swelling so bad I couldn't see the drive. I couldn't wear my contacts because I think and it's a sty and a sty is an infection. I'm not going to infect my contacts. I couldn't see anyway. Well, I, I was more concerned with the fact that God doesn't lie. And he told me, we don't get styes, not this family. And I'm not giving up on anything that God gave me. You start giving up territory and you'll end up with nothing. And I, I know this and I've learned this. So I'm not, I, 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 God, I need you. I didn't understand it. And much less severe situation than Job. But I'm showing you how that when you know something about God, but something in, is happening in your life that goes against what you know, what you know in faith, what you know to be truth, not and, and the circumstance happening and coming against it, it's not changing your belief or your theology. See, that's what men that waver, that's what they do. They change their theology when the circumstances don't match up. And, uh, you know, oh, well, then God doesn't heal because this one died in their sins. Well, they, this one, pardon me, not in their sins, in their sickness. Well, the scripture tells us that Elijah, Elisha, pardon me, died of his sickness. And yet we would think, okay, if he's sick, then, you, you know, he's buried. But he's the one whose bones caused another man to live, whose dead bones caused another man 
to live so that we don't understand how could he die sick and yet his bones have so much efficacy that it made somebody come to life, made a dead man come to life. There's things that we don't understand that happen and it should not change what we know of God. I know that he's good and that there's bad stuff happening. I can't say that God did it. Now, the scriptures let us know that people do fret against God and people do that. I'm letting you know that if you're moving in faith and your faith is not wavering, you might be confused by some circumstances that happen. You might know that this thing is exalting itself against the knowledge of God. It cannot. It cannot be. But you do not waver on your faith in God. Kind of like the Hebrew boys, uh, Anani, Azariah, Mishael, who most of you like to call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't, because I don't like to identify by the name that the heathen puts on you. Uh, I like to go by the name that God gave. So Anani, Azariah, Mishael, in its fiery furnace, those three, three Hebrew boys, and they were young boys. And they said, we don't know whether God will do this or that, but... We do know we're not going to bow. And here the unprecedented thing happened. The worst than what they could imagine happened. You know, most of us, when we stand, we want it to turn for good. Here they stood and it turned for worse. The, the king made that, that furnace seven times hotter than what it was. Sometimes you pray and things get worse. I always like to let people know and hear this and hear it well. When you pray... And when you stand on something and you're bringing the word to something and it jumps back, you need to know it's listening. You, you, you have a pet in your house. I know everybody doesn't have a pet, but you understand what I'm talking about, the example I'm bringing. If you have a pet in your house and you tell him sit or you tell him uh, to do something or her, the pet, uh, and they, they bark back at you, you know they heard you. And you tell them again so that they obey you. And this is the way that we need to take the things of God. When we move in faith and your stuff starts talking back to you and it gets worse. And, and you, most of us aren't living things like the furnace is, is heated seven times hotter. Now these are the end times and some of us are going to be living through things like that. And some of you already have been living like that. You know what I'm talking about. But you've got to know that when God... When God brings a deliverance, it's a mighty deliverance. It's like what the Hebrew boys got that, that they looked in. Not only was the, the fire seven times hotter, but there was one, when the heathen looked in, there was one walking in there that looked like the Son of God. Now, they didn't say an angel. They said a Son of God. So you need to understand that just because you pray and things got worse doesn't mean that you're not praying right. It doesn't mean that your faith is right. You don't waver. So uh, let me bring back to the scripture here for let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his elevation. Make sure you do that. The word tells you to do that. Don't be part of those that pull somebody down and wonder who does he think he is? Who does she think she is? When you see someone is exalted, when you see that someone is lauded and appreciated, God is the one who does that. People that walk around strutting their own stuff, you let them do it and the pride's going to bring them down. Pride goes before a fall. But when someone is humble and they're brought up, rejoice with those who rejoice. That's what the word tells you to do. So follow the word and do the word. Do what the word says. Don't, don't sniff at them, snuff at them, or try to ignore them because they're exalted and you're not. Your turn is coming. This word is to you too. And then he, but he lets know um, the Christian, the Christian called to true riches uh, and to be heir of God. And then in verse 10, he says, the rich person, don't wonder what happened. Don't wonder what's wrong. Everything was all right yesterday. And oh my. That's what Job said in verse 29. He says, I'm going to tell you a parable. I'm gonna, and then he says, I wish it was like it was a few months ago. Everything was good when the, the light of God was on me. The glory of God was with me. You, you want to know how it was. And you don't turn around and, um, and say that, oh, God isn't good anymore. No, he continued to know that God is good. That's how he got double when he came out. That's how he, he was humbled. He was the rich who was humbled. And then from humility, he was exalted back up again. And so you want to stay and not waver. You don't want to waver. And uh, I'm going to skip to, to verse 11. For the sun comes up with a scorching heat and parches the grass. 
well, let me back up. No, I don't want to skip. Shouldn't even skip. So, and the rich person ought to glory in being humbled by being shown his human frailty. Now, mind you, this isn't an excuse. I'm only human. It's not an excuse not to move in faith. It's not an excuse not to do something that God has given you to do. Because we're to do the works that Jesus did in greater works. So this isn't an excuse not to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This isn't an excuse of why you're drinking and sipping when uh, it's not good, O Lamuel. Proverbs, what is it? Proverbs 30, Proverbs 31. It's not good, O Lamuel. It's not good for princes to drink strong uh, drink. Nor kings, I, one is wine and the other strong drink. And remember, we already reminded you that you're a royal priesthood. You're a, a holy generation. You're a royal priesthood. So it's not good. And when God said it wasn't good, he meant it wasn't good. So, and he tells you that it perverts your judgment. We want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't want to be drunk with wine we're in its excess. We want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't want our judgment perverted. We have to judge angels in the next life. We're going to get practice now on how to judge without being judgmental. So he says here, the person ought to glory being made humble, uh, being shown as human frailty, just the humanness, not sin, humanness, because like the flower, see the flower is not sin, like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. There's a frailty there. He's not talking about sin. He's talking about that you're not just not able to stand in every single thing. God will strengthen you. There's, there's scriptures that tell you that God will give you strength. And there's scriptures that tell you God will be your strength, both. Sometimes you walk in the strength because God made you strong. And other times you walk in, he's walking through you. He's upholding you. You don't have the strength and the power for some of the things he's doing it in you. That's why he lives in you. Ah, Lord God, he is the hope of glory. So, for the sun comes up with a scorching heat and parches the grass. God made the grass and God made the sun. And you'll wonder what in the world is going on just like Job did. But if you just give God glory, if you just exalt him and not waver in faith, you will have the reward that you were supposed to have. So, we're going to wrap this up in a minute. Just enjoy Holmes Family Music. It ministers life to your spirit, your soul, and your circumstance.
bless you, bless you, bless you. Now, I want us to understand that because of the placement of James, Peter, John, Jude, that it's close to Revelation, we don't get into it as much as we need to. The, as a new believer, you need to have this so that you know how to walk strong. And most of us, we're grown in the Lord, and we haven't even been through this like this. And yet we all know that we go through trials. That's part of living and part of life. And we go through we go through temptation. We know that we're tempted. That's part of living and that's part of life. And most of us, we see it in rampant in the church from not just in previous generations, but even now. We don't know how to deal with temptation because we're not giving this as soon as we're supposed to have it. Uh, it's it's um, kind of like it, God is the one who put in the mother's milk the antibodies that a baby needs so to grow. And you need more antibodies at the beginning of life, at the first time in life, that you do in the rest of your growing. And as a matter of fact, God is the one who said for um, the male child uh, in Levitical law, the male child to be circumcised on the eighth day, because the eighth day is when the antibodies are at the highest point for for a child. And it is like that with the word, that the, the, the New Testament, uh, following the canon of the Old Testament, James, Peter, John, Jude was next after that which establishes you, the Pentateuch, which establishes you in the the precepts of God. And when you get it later, or some of you can relate to cooking, if, you, if you're beating, uh, making a batter or something, and you put the flour in at a different time, uh, you try to, uh, uh, I, I like to, to make different things, and certain ingredients have to be put in a certain time. Um, or you're going to have something because you put something together, but it's not going to be exactly what it's supposed to be. It's not going to be that great chocolate mousse if you pour in the milk at a time that it wasn't supposed to go in or at a temperature that it wasn't supposed to go. And that's that, it's that way when we get the word at a different time, that when we get, when we are, when it's part of the milk of the word that we get, we grow into some strong saints when we automatically know how to handle our trials. We automatically know what to do and we're not flaked out and we're not concerned. And we're, we know we're focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and know how to walk this thing. And that's what James is letting us know. Now, just because we didn't get it as milk when we were first born into the kingdom because uh, the Roman world changed the order of the scripture on us. But now it just means that... <laughs> Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says, if you don't wet the axe, you need to use more strength. In other words, if you don't sharpen the axe. If you didn't get it when you were supposed to get it, it just takes more to get it in there now. Most of you know that a child can learn a language when they're very, very young. They can learn two and three languages all at one time. But when you try to do it when you're older, it takes more. You have to use more strength, more mental strength, more practice strength to do the same thing. So that's what I'm letting you know about the book of James, that this was supposed to be given to us as newborn babes so that, ah, we grow up with this and we're automatically knowing how to walk this. And nobody has to tell us that faith without works is dead. It's nothing. We know that because we've lived that. But when we walk it out and walk these things out, and we don't get these things till later. It takes more work, more exercise. But we're, we're living a day and time where there's uh, uh, fitness clubs everywhere. We know to exercise, even for those of us that don't. We know that exercise, bodily exercise, profits little. I want you to exercise yourself in the Word. I'm exercising myself in the Word because it's what makes us strong saints. So understand this, that... Uh, Ah, in verse 10, oh, pardon me, let me go to, well, 10 and 11 should go together. So that because like the flower of the field, he shall pass away. That's the rich man when he goes through. Don't think it's something strange. Just just glorify. He says he ought to, he ought to glory because God's showing him this wondrous thing. God made the flower and God made the sun and yet the sun is burning up the flower and it's going to pass away. It's not that the devil did this. No. I tell you what. We need to, as saints everywhere, talking to the devil like he's God. Like he sees, sees all, knows all, and hears us all at one time. No, God's the one who hears all our prayers at, all, at one time. Not the devil. And we need to get some things straight. And these things straighten it out for us. It, we don't even, can't even have that mindset if we have this. 
but now it's going to take more work, more exercise to, to get it in and get that understanding in our heart, soul, mind, and so that it's part of our strength. And so he says, um, the rich person, he are the glory. For the sun comes up with a scorching heat, uh, parches the grass, its flower falls off, and its beauty fades away. Now, if this is happening in your life and you need to know God's the one who made the sun, the devil didn't bring the sun, God did this. And, and he's letting you know it's a part of the process. It's not he's against you or even the trials are against you. And God teaches you these things. It's just part of process. It's just part of living. Job got through it. You can get through it. And so he says, uh, I lost where I was. Was I in 11 here? He says, even so, the rich man, rather he die in the midst of his own pursuits. Uh, so that like that fasting chapter it starts us out with everybody getting what they prayed for what they believed for but it's still the faith but I said fasting chapter I meant the faith chapter Hebrews 11 but he lets us know that some died in faith and they were looking for their promise and then God shows you and even if God doesn't show you you believe him you don't waver off of your faith in God and so the rich man might die before it comes. Everybody doesn't get double for their trouble. Moses didn't get to go into the promised land because of something he did wrong. But God made a promise to him that you'll see my glory. And so we see him in the Mount of Transfiguration in the glory of God. Because God keeps his promises. But we can't figure out how he's going to do it. We just keep in faith. You know, we ask in faith. Nothing wavering. We do not waver. When it doesn't happen the way we thought, we don't waver. We do not waver. We believe God. We know that he's good. Circumstances aren't always so good, but we know that it's good. It doesn't feel good if, if you're the flower and the sun is, is parching you. And if that sun is a leader that God put over you, you don't curse the leader and say that, oh, that they're doing this because they're hurting you. No. We need to know that some things God put in order and we're to... <laughs> I don't want to use expressions. Most of our expressions come out of stuff that isn't even so. But blessed and happy uh, to be enlivened is the man who is patient under trial. Patient under trial. And do you hear under? God understands that you're under. But he understands that he's going to exalt you. And you may not understand that when you're going through. Uh, usually the trials that are, are, are big enough to meet all of us. And when I don't mean all of us like each one. I'm talking about fill us up. The trial is as big as we are. And it doesn't bother God. When he, when he told the storm be muzzled, you know, we love that peace be still. It says that there was a great storm. You hear me tell that all the time. The scripture tells you there was a great storm. And after Jesus spoke to it, it said it was a great calm. So that our trials come and it's everything. And, and and if you look, you've grown. The trial isn't as big. The, it was a smaller trial that you went through before that you thought was everything. But you've grown because the trial does what God says that it does. When you're going through it, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like it's going to kill you. It feels like it's going to take you under. And that's because it could if you don't move in faith. Yeah, it can take you under. Just like when Peter walked on the water, the storm made him sink when he looked at the storm. But you're supposed to be looking at Jesus, and so am I. So I remind myself, and I encourage myself, and I encourage you to stay in the word. So let not him say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted from God. For God is incapable, do you hear this? Incapable of being tempted by what is evil. And he tempts no one. God does not bring evil to you to draw you away. He's letting you know that when you're drawn away, it's of your own lusts. God didn't put that lust in you. The temptation might come, but God is faithful and good to deliver you. Get that, keep that, hold on to that. Faith that doesn't waver. Amen? You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. 
you always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit, and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent, and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high, and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance, and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to His glory, His virtue, and His praise. You are elected to His power, His loving kindness, and His grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call, and the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God.